You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a woman calling an accommodation agency about properties to rent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to four. Easy, let. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I saw your advertisement in the paper, and I'm calling to ask about renting a flat. Certainly. What kind of flat had you in mind? Well, um. I don't know exactly. I mean, it depends on price to some extent. Okay. Now we have properties across the whole range. The average is probably a hundred and twenty pounds a week. Oh, I was hoping for something a little cheaper. They start at ninety pounds. That's the lowest we have usually, and they go up to two hundred pounds. I could manage the lowest figure. An important question is how long you're thinking of staying in the property. We don't do short lets. I'd want a flat for nine months, perhaps longer. That would be fine. Our contracts are for a standard six months, and that can be extended. Fine. I'd need to come in and see you. Yes, our office is open from nine a.m. to five p.m. I'd need to come in on Saturday. Okay, then we're here between ten a.m. and four p.m. We also open on Sunday mornings until one p.m. Saturday is fine. If possible, I'd like to see details of some properties first. We can post you a list, or you may find it easier to look on the internet. Oh yes, I have the address here. Thank you. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to seven. Now listen and answer questions five to seven. What else would you like to know? I wonder what I might need to buy for a flat. What's included in the rent? That depends on the flat to a certain extent. Although some things are standard in all flats. For example, every flat has kitchen equipment provided for your use. Good. Does that also mean tableware, cups, glasses, plates? In some flats, but not all. Okay, and bathroom towels, sheets, and so on. I don't think any flats have those included. I can easily buy some. I don't suppose flats come with a TV. In fact, they all do, although they may not be the most modern models. Oh, that's fine. But it's different with the telephone. That's up to you to organise. These days, most people seem just to use their mobile phone. I can imagine. What extra charges would I get? Is heating extra? Yes, it is, but the water bill is part of the rent, so you don't have to pay for that. Right, I've noted all that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, 
You have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Are you looking to move into a flat soon? I hope so, yes. The thing is, we have a few flats at the moment that we'd like to get rented out by the end of the month. I see. They're all good flats and at the price you want. There's one in Eastern Towers, one in Granby Mansions and another in Busby Garden. All three are nice blocks of flats. Could you tell me where they are? I'm at the train station at the moment. Eastern Towers, if you're coming from the station, isn't very far. Cross over City Bridge, then go left, and where the road divides, you want the right-hand fork. You'll see Eastern Towers on the left side of the road. It's a lovely building with trees around it. That sounds nice. What about Granby Mansions? And the best way to get there from the station is probably to go down River Road and then cross over Old Bridge. The road bends to the right round the park, and if you follow along, you'll find it there on the left side. That's a great location with lovely views of the park. Very nice. And you said there was one more? Busby Garden, yes. OK, from the station, cross over City Bridge, keep going through the first crossroads until you come to the second crossroads. Busby Garden will be facing you over to the right side. It's very convenient for the shops. Fine, thank you. Well, I'll see you on Saturday. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear the organiser of a group holiday talking to the group before they arrive at their destination. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. I hope you're all looking forward to arriving at the town. I thought you might like to know a few things while we're still on the coach, and it'll help to pass the time on our journey. OK, as you know, we're staying at the Park Hotel. It's comfortable and friendly. We're booked in for three nights. Now, I'm aware that not everyone wants breakfast there, so if you do want it, you should tell the hotel that you do the night before. We're making our own arrangements for dinner each evening, and there's a cafe open at the hotel most of the time if you want a drink or a snack. There's also a very pleasant lounge on the ground floor with a collection of fascinating paintings. And then I hope you're going to enjoy the various activities that are lined up. However... I do have to tell you that there have been some changes since the original programme. For one, because it's been restored and is therefore closed to the public, we won't be going to the castle after all, I'm afraid. However, there's plenty else to see, and the gardens are still open. Something we've been able to add to the programme is for Saturday, when a local historian will give us a lecture on famous people from the town. 
I don't know who that includes yet. So, to free up the time for that, we've made another little amendment and changed the trip to the antique show that was due for then on to Sunday. Actually, I think that'll make for a more relaxed programme anyway. We're leaving the rest of Sunday free for you to wander around as you wish. One place you might like to try is the art gallery, because it's got a huge display of old postcards. You can't really send them home to your family and friends, but it's interesting and sometimes funny to see what people used to send. Well, um, that's the lot on changes. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 17 to 20. I thought it could be useful to try and get your bearings now before we actually arrive, so I'll give you a few pointers on your maps. OK, um, first things first, the Park Hotel, because I assume you'll want to deposit your luggage before anything else, will be driving into the town from the west and stopping at the bus station. To get to the hotel, just go straight down the high street towards the railway bridge and after the bridge, if you go left, you'll soon see it on the right. As I say, it's a nice place. You can check in, see your rooms, relax a little. There are a couple of interesting little shops nearby. There aren't any internet facilities at the hotel, I'm afraid, so if you want to send any emails, you'll need to get yourselves to the internet cafe. In fact, if you want to do that first, it's easy because it's near the bus station, on the corner towards the right of Curtis Lane and Kramer Street. So, once you've done that, well, if you do that, then I suppose you'll be ready to do a bit of exploring. You've got your basic maps, but you may want to get more information, and the Tourist Information Office is the place to do that. It's up around the train station area. From the bus station, you could go up any of the streets to the left, Cadogan Road, Earl Street or Duke Street. The office is directly facing the train station on the corner with Earl Street. They've got all sorts of brochures and leaflets about local attractions and tickets for sale. They even sell some locally produced jams and chocolates. And a last pointer at this stage is our venue for dinner tonight, the Royal House Restaurant. This is conveniently located in the very centre of town. In fact, you'll no doubt pass it as you're walking around beforehand. In relation to the bus station, it's not far. Going down the high street, if you pass the corner with Cromwell Road, then the next junction is a crossroads with Duke Street and Runton Road, and it's there. You'll be able to see its rather grand entrance over on the left corner. The food and the service there are both excellent, so it promises to be an enjoyable evening. Well, uh, we're just coming into the town now, so... If you'd like... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students called Helen and Paul talking to their tutor about a nursing course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Helen and Paul, congratulations to you both for doing so well the past semester. You two have exhibited an impeccable performance during your first year in the nursing programme. I'd like to get some feedback from the two of you to better improve the programme and to provide guidance for our prospective students. I'd like to start with you, Helen. So, first of all, which aspect of the programme impressed you? Well, to be honest, when I was enrolled into the course, I was expecting a group of classmates my age. But as I stepped into the classroom for the first time, I was surprised by the diversity. Most were in their 20s, but there were also those in the 30s or even 40s. As it turns out, the intergenerational communication has sparked intense debate and new thinking, and I think that's something special about the programme that I appreciate very much. What about you, Paul? What do you think of the programme? For me, the group project we carried out last semester is another key feature of the programme. The whole class was divided into eight different groups, working on eight prospective cases. Team building sessions were conducted in a collaborative way most of the time. Comprised of five members, our group studied acute pancreatitis. During the process, we broke the task into different parts and assigned them to each member. We were then able to tackle the complex problem by pooling our knowledge and skills. More importantly, stronger links were established between the group members. Because of the project, we've all become good friends. That's true. According to graduates, group projects prepare them for the work world in which teamwork and collaboration are increasingly the norm. So tell me, Paul, what else do you like about the programme? I want to be a registered nurse working in a public hospital after graduation. So the internship provided is a valuable opportunity for clinical practice in a supportive learning atmosphere. However, I was amazed by the amount of written assignments since I thought the course should have focused more on practice-oriented learning. Well, I have to disagree with you, Paul. The essays demonstrate your understanding of the course. For me, writing essays is a process that involves critical thinking, which challenges me to develop my points more thoroughly. I thus manage to gain a diversity of perspectives. The programme is designed to deliver basic and advanced theoretical knowledge of core concepts, including healthcare systems concepts, together with practicum or clinical practice experience to bridge the classroom content to the practice setting. So, I'm afraid written work is unavoidable. Also this year, we've added a module of law. How do you feel about that? At first, we felt that learning law is kind of redundant and too time-consuming. After a few sessions, we realised that it is necessary in dealing with future medical disputes. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Do you have any suggestions for prospective students? What bothers me most is handing in essays on time. I almost missed the deadline once because there were three essays due within the same week. So rationalising your time is critical. Well, that's true. The lectures deliver so much useful information. I have poor memory, so I kept making notes and revisiting them on a regular basis. To my surprise, at the end of the semester, I have learnt the key concepts by heart. How was the research? I heard that it was quite challenging. How did you manage to overcome the difficulties? That's true. The majority of us had no clue how to carry out the research at first. Fortunately, when I was digging up reference materials at the library, I sought help from the librarian. 
she taught me about finding the appropriate resources and choosing the proper research methods. Have you checked out the online forum? Yes, it has become a habit for me to visit the forum regularly. In a sense, it extends classroom learning. It is where the students post academic problems that they come across and get support from the faculty members. Some of my classmates didn't do so well during the placement tests. I feel that background reading is necessary. Lastly, do you have anything to say to the freshmen? I was really ambitious at first, trying to get straight A's on my transcript. I made tons of notes and worked hard even on the optional assignments to get extra credit. I stressed myself out before having an emotional breakdown. After consulting my advisor, I found it important to set realistic goals. Don't push yourself too hard. It is wise to sort out your priorities. Thank you for coming here today and providing valuable feedback on the programme. Have a great summer break. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. In this section, you are going to hear a talk on wild rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good morning. Today we'd like to talk about wild rice. Contrary to what many people believe, wild rice is not rice at all, but a grass. Much of it sold in the world today is not even wild, but rather cultivated varieties that do not occur naturally. Wild rice is really an annual aquatic seed found mostly in the upper freshwater lakes of Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin and Minnesota in North America. Indians gathered wild rice before any explorers set foot on the North American continent. Early explorers were greatly impressed with the strength and hardiness of the woodland Indians and attributed their vitality to their ample servings of wild rice. Wild rice can grow in water as shallow as three or four feet along marshes and muddy waters. A tall plant, it grows to a height of eight to ten feet, with a long flower cluster that reminds one of a narrow broom. The grains in their husks on the tall stalk looks somewhat like oats. Truly wild rice is a challenging crop to grow. Even today, it's very susceptible to failure due to weather conditions. If a heavy windstorm comes along just before harvesting, the seeds can be blown into the water, ruining an entire crop. Harvesting at just the right time becomes a matter of beating the birds to it since wild rice is considered a delicacy by many birds living in the area. Other challenges include insects, disease, poor drainage and high waters. If the grains are too green, they are difficult to thresh or beat out of their husks. If left on the plant too long, even a few days too long, they fall off the plant into the water. Airboats have brought about recent improvements in commercial harvesting of the wild rice, 
while newer techniques for parching, winnowing and hulling have been a help in saving time and labour. Still, it takes about three pounds of grass seed to yield one pound of wild rice. Buyers should be aware of two types of wild rice, gathered and commercial. Foraged or hand-harvested wild rice is gradually being pushed out of the market by hybrid commercial varieties. Hand-harvested wild rice makes up less than 20% of the market today. Heirloom varieties of this foraged grain still exist. In fact, it is the only heirloom grain sold commercially. However, package labels can be deceiving. Though the label may read Indian harvested or organic, the product may be hybridised wild rice placed in freshwater lakes and gathered by Indians in airboats. Hand harvested, organic and from the Great Lakes region is the real thing with superior flavour and aroma, but it may be difficult to find. Though wild rice is one of the most expensive grains, it goes a long way. Some say that one pound of the grain can feed 30 people. To compensate for its high cost, try combining wild rice half and half with brown rice. For a truly colourful presentation, try one third of each, white rice, brown rice, and wild rice. This is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.